time to run it off. I wake up. All right, everybody, welcome to the Profit Rocket Podcast. This is episode number 22. I'm your host, Victor Rancor, and today I got an exciting guest uh, coming onto our onto the podcast. His name is Kevin Fiskor. Uh, Kevin is not only a friend of mine, client of ours, uh, but just a downright a badass dude in, in general. The reason I brought Kevin on is because he's just like you guys, right? And just like me. We started off with nothing. I started off as a technician trying to figure out how to run a business. Not only did he figure it out, but he's been able to scale to you know one of the top companies in his market. Keep in mind, he's, a, he's in a small market of Sedona, Arizona, where obviously there's not as many clients, but he's been able to take massive market share in a short period of time. So I want to get him to come on, tell his story, talk a little bit about his journey, and talk about some of the things he's done to start taking over a market, even when there's not that many people. So Kevin, man, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So Kevin, um, obviously I wanted to bring you on because a lot of my listeners are the small guy, man. Just like, just like I was a couple of years ago, just like you were, uh, starting out with the hope and a dream and just trying to figure out what to do. So I want to touch a little bit about your story, obviously your background, how you started in the industry, stuff like that. And we'll lead into, you know, starting Fiscor uh, Heating and Air and then, you know, kind of where you are today. So uh, first and foremost, let's uh, tell our, our listeners a little bit about you and, and what you've been doing in your career and how you got to this point. Well, I've been in HVAC about 20 years and I basically fell into it. Um, I was waiting tables and I needed, a, I needed a trade. I needed something, you know, that would provide for me and my girlfriend now wife at the time but uh long story short i just basically shotgun laborers to everybody filled out all the apps and then uh an ac company called me and i fell in love from there they're like hey uh do you have a pulse or what (laughs) (laughs) you know it's it's 110 now can you breathe all right good get in this truck buddy is that is that kind of how the gist of it when you first started or yeah basically i didn't know what i was getting into and um i fell into it and I just loved it and then just worked my way up from there. I've done about just about everything, you know, in this trade from low temp refrigeration, mid temp to commercial to industrial. So I just love, I love the residential market. So when you started out, did you start out as like a, uh, you know, just a journeyman technician or like, how did you start out? Like, what was your first job or they were, they have you running ducks in Arizona in the summer? Uh, I believe I started out at five fifteen an hour just uh oh, flexing shit. out houses and um and just went from there um went from helper to lead installer saw what my technician buddies were making saw the commissions then you know did a bunch of night school became a technician thought i knew everything you know once i got out of school i didn't know shit <laughs> but uh yeah i just kept on growing and digging into the books and just you know keep evolving you want to talk a little bit about that you know the trade school and, and that's one of the things i talk about all the time is that in this industry really needs some trade school reform because i feel like they're not really even teaching half these guys mm-hmm. anything man they get out of trade school and i feel like half of the guys are you know worse off than a guy i found over at walmart you know i could have brought him in and, and got him training within a couple of weeks and got him a lot more lessons you want to talk a little bit about what the trade school did for you or didn't do for you or wish that they would have done because this is something that I, I talk about pretty often is that like, I just feel like they're dropping the ball somewhere and there's some, there's gotta be some kind of fix to it. But I mean, what did you get out of the trade school and what would you think they could have done better? It's basically like anybody else, you get the theory. And as you know, you know, there's times to where you're scratching your head. This is not possible, you know, it, but there's thousands of things that can't go wrong with the system. So, um, Basically, I would just say a lot more hands-on and just not one specific brand of equipment because we service everything. Yeah, I didn't really think about that as far as like the brands that they have in there because it could just be, hey, I'm just a Goodman. They just have Goodman units or whatever was donated to them probably. Yeah, anything, 100%. So. so you're sitting in trade school. You've already been an installer on the, on the obviously, you've been a you know helper and then you've been a lead installer. And now you're saying, I want to get into being a technician, right? And obviously... We got into being a technician or sales rep because of the commissions, right? You want to make more money and you want to have a, you know, a high earning potential, right? Like you want to have a job that's going to have a high earning potential. So you kind of took that leap. 
one of the things you did was like you had to take a step back, right, to go to school. So you're willing to go go to school at night, where most guys are like not willing to take that step back or go take that extra leap or leap forward, I guess you would call it. Uh, what kind of prompted you to do that? And and you want to talk about a little bit about your schedule at that time? I mean, obviously you must have been working all day, and then you're going to this at night. Like, how tiring was that? Like, did you ever give up at that point, or how was that? I'm getting goosebumps, honestly. You know, there's just days in the attic where you just want to cry, you want to quit, but back then there was 20 people behind you not to where you know we're having problems finding people now so long story short it was a lot of long days school to start at 6 p.m and i work for a company in phoenix and they were nice enough to allow me to get off at 5 30 to take my work truck to school until 10 o'clock and then go home start all over again but my wife can attest uh i, I was never home and on the weekends you sleep so yeah and that's i mean i think that's a testament to like pretty much anybody that's been in this industry that's ever been good at anything right like we had to put some long hours into it a lot of people think like i talk to technicians all the time they think they're going to pop in and then you know day one they're going to be good right mm -hmm. and it, it's a false hope in reality i don't think they see the other stuff that goes on the back end that you have to learn and the hours you have to put in to actually get good at this crap because it's not a it's not an overnight thing it just isn't um, so you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, how was the relationship? Cause I mean, there's a lot of guys on here that probably are working those 15, 16 hour days and, and they're struggling with their wife. And how was, how was that conversation, you know, heading into that? I mean, obviously you had to have been some kind of precursor to it. Like, Hey, we're going to do this so we could have this later. How'd that conversation go? It really wasn't an issue. I got a very supportive wife and she knows I'm a hard worker and I go after and get what I want. So I wanted to better our lives to be able to become a, technician a selling tech and to basically just go from there i didn't want to install equipment every single day as a technician i love the breakup of it you know every call is different every call is a different situation so um, that's kind of awesome so how far were you in the industry at this point so obviously you know you were an installer your helper an installer and now you're doing now you're doing trade school how how far were you in at that point about four years about four years. So you already had four years under your belt. You still at this point didn't know shit. Right? Yeah. I mean, really. I just, I just knew how to, you know, put it together, make it look great, you know, photo quality. But there was those times to where, That's hey, uh, I need help. I, the unit isn't starting, you know. So I didn't, I didn't like the feeling of that. And let alone as a lead installer, all my friends that were technicians, I looked up to them as rock stars. They're the guys who came in when you – even being a lead installer four years into it, you're not a technician. So, I mean, you can wire it up, install it how it needs to be. Uh, <laughs> I think there's, you know, there's always that, there's always that animosity, right? Between install service sales, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, install, installers are smarter than the service techs and the service techs are smarter than the installers and the sales guys know everything, obviously. Yeah. That's what we do. But um, at the end of the day, like you, you have to have both, right? And I think that's kind of, Cool, because I have a lot of obviously a lot of installers on my staff, and my I don't think any of them have taken really the time. There's there's like two guys I think have taken the time to actually understand the technical side, understand how to diagnose things, how to understand how to troubleshoot when they do run into a problem. Because you, you do, I mean, that's you know, especially when you're installing a bunch of you know, bunch of equipment all the time. It's just like there's always going to be a problem. Something's going to come up. Every house is different. So, you know, if you guys are installers listening to this, you guys should take the time to learn to be a technician. And I suggest that if you're a technician, you should take the time to understand what it takes to install some shit. And a sales rep, right? Like so many sales guys out there don't even understand what goes into an install and they're selling it. And then on the back end, their installers hate them, right? Like if you have, if your installers hate you, it's because you haven't taken the time to learn what they do and you should actually take your time and learn it because it's going to help your not only selling skills, but also, you know, making sure that you're actually selling stuff that can be done, right? Yeah, I got a funny story about that. that. Um, it was my birthday. I asked for a half day, you know, I was just a lead installer at the time. The office told me, well, we got a package unit change out for you. Well, it was an old uh, furnace only on the roof, no AC, and that turned into a new cut-in. And finally at 4 o'clock, I was on my own, and finally at 4 o'clock, we got a couple more crews, and that was an 18-hour day on my birthday. That was one of those where, you know, you just want to say, fuck it, I'm done, but you got to provide for your, for your family. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's difficult because we've all been there. I mean, I've worked plenty of birthdays since I've been in this industry and it's kind of like, and as we get older, right, it's not, it's not our birthdays. You don't, you don't celebrate as much as you used to. Right. But it's still those, those long days when you're, you're sitting at home and you're like, dude, like, how did I get myself in this position? Right. Like 
especially where, you know, you can't just say like, fuck you, I'm going to go home. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's, and that's the, the beauty and, and probably the conversation we have as you transition into being a business owner. Right. Which I don't feel like you've worked any less. I feel like you actually work more now. Oh, definitely. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So you're, you're a couple years in, you get out of trade school, you start being, becoming a technician. Um, obviously you got to first as a technician, you got to pick up the technical and then how was it, you know, trying to pick up the communication skills? Cause you go from not having to communicate probably with a bunch of owners or, or, or homeowners and all stuff like that. to now you have to explain everything to them. How was that transition? It really actually wasn't bad for me. Um, come from, you know, the food industry, you know, being a server, taking orders, it, it kind of went hand in hand. So my communication was open, but that's one of the biggest things about technicians. They're horrible communicators. And, you know, I wasn't horrible with the customers, but there was times to where I was very short and with the office and you know, that's your backup. So you really can't, you know. Yeah. If you are listening to this, you're a technician or a sales rep. I highly suggest you, uh, watch your damn lip with your office staff. Cause like that's, they're going to decide where you go. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, your boss and all that stuff, but now the dispatchers are going to decide a lot. And I talk to my technicians all the time. It's like, dude, there, there's, there's certain people you can go off on man. yell at your managers, yell at some other people, don't yell at the damn dispatcher. You want to have good, if you want to make money, you know? Yeah. We had a, we had a dispatcher named Roxanne and me and my buddy, Chris, um, she was very demanding. And if you got short with her, you know, she messed your schedule up. So, Anyways, I just came off on call rotation. I was out in East Mesa. I lived in Central Phoenix. So the 60 is just horrible coming back into town. And I called my buddy Chris because we were supposed to go out to the bar. And uh, I go, hey, where are you at? He goes, I'm literally a mile from your apartment. I go, Chris, that's funny because I'm literally like five miles from yours. Why are we swapped on the other side of town? But yeah, just that's a lesson, you know, a lesson for you. Just don't be short and uh, as stressful as you are, as stressful as it is and as hot as it is, just clearly communicate with dispatch in the office. Get them some flowers some gift cards. I don't give a Coffees. shit what you want. Well, don't get them flowers if you got a wife and stuff. They're going <laughs> to end up ugly for you, I'll tell you that much. But like coffee in the morning, gift cards, you know what I mean? A little sending some money through the Zelle. Whatever you got to do, man. You got to, you know, it's it's cat and mouse game in this world. And you got to you got to know how to play the game. So if you guys are listening Learn how to play the game, man. Be be friends with your tech, your your dispatcher, and they'll take care of you. Normally, uh, they got a job to do too. So, so now you're a technician. You're out in the field, and how many calls a day was your boss having you run? Because I know, like when I met you, you're running like 14, 16 calls a day. So, like, what was your boss having you do? Was that kind of like the, the way you were taught? Or I'm just kind of sick to my stomach right now. I got goosebumps, and uh, <laughs> you're just a number with these big companies. And they, they run you and they're going to keep on running you. And it was just that mentality of Phoenix cutting my teeth and just being hungry. And I'm a workaholic, honestly. So it, uh, that's where that mindset came from is just the hustle and bustle of Phoenix. Yeah. Summertime it's, it's right. ground zero. Yeah. I mean, you're running just call after call after call. So, but now obviously You've been working these long days, right? He's got you working 14, 14, 15 calls a day, running through run caps probably like crazy, right? And, and I would imagine you guys is, you guys are in and out on those calls in like, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, and it, it, I mean, we are doing so much volume that we had a full-time parts runner. I won't even go into his nickname, but the guy what liked his drugs, Tweaker Chuck. Tweaker Chuck. Yeah, so he would go around and restock the vans. He'd come to your house and restock your vans for you. This is before all the days to where... You know, you take a picture and everything's through your call management software and everything's inventoried. But yeah, he would just go through a restock. And then during the day, if you were getting low, because we weren't allowed to stop at the parts house and you know how much time is wasted at the parts house with all, you know, the bullshitting and the popcorn and the drinks and sitting yeah. around. So you're running, running 14, 15 calls a day. You guys are just popping run caps in like fucking they're going out of style. And how did, how did you guys get paid? Like, were you guys get paid per call you ran or were you paid per, you know, repair or a percentage or how was that set up? So obviously if you're running that many calls, like you gotta be freaking paid for that shit. It was hourly. Hourly? Yeah. No commission on that? No commission on that. Okay. So obviously you got in and I don't know what kind of hourly you guys are making out there. And, and I, I couldn't imagine running 14 calls a day without making some commission because I wouldn't even like talking to 14 people. Yeah. Day. We got commission on, on equipment and stuff like that, but basically, you know, it was, it was a tech turnover. So, you know, we got a percentage of the salesman selling, but 
for the most part, we didn't get any commission on sales. There was no performance pay. There was none of this. This was 2004. So I believe I was making 18 bucks an hour. Hey, that was a lot better than I was doing in 2004. Yeah. I was 2004. I was still in high school and I had just got my first job making 475 an hour at the movie theater. So a little bit better than me. So that's good. Uh, so, so now you're, you're a technician, you're doing this. How long were you as a technician before you, you know, obviously decided to jump off on your own and, and have your entrepreneurial seizure? Five years ago. Five years ago. So five years ago. So you're in about 15 years. You're running for another company. Yeah. Other, I've been there and done that in the trade. Um, I've worked for residential companies. Like I said, I've worked for, um, facilities. I've worked for, um, the state as a refrigeration mechanic. It's basically all what I could get into for the stuff that I conditioned, but, um, took a job at his resort as an HVAC supervisor. We did everything completely in house, the low type refrigeration. I personally did. I'm. I'm a nerd at this type of stuff. So, you know, in school, we went over low temp for about five days and that was it just because this trade is so diverse. Yeah. But I'm just, you know, I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to HVAC. And I, mean, I feel like that's something that's, you know, a common, I think, common thing with you, right? Like, I feel like whatever you go do, you go all in on it. Like, I even remember the first time you came to my training. I think I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody take more notes than you. You want to talk a little bit about that and, and how that's helped you obviously progress pretty fast is like, you know, when you're it looks like when anytime you're like involved in something or doing it, you're all in on it. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, I have ADHD. I haven't been on medication since I was 18. It basically just took all the drive away from me. So basically, you know, I need chaos. Not that it is chaos, but I need to stay busy. So basically when I'm taking notes, um, first class it was about 20 pages of notes in those three days we did um, the very first class you put on but basically if I don't write it down I'm not going to be able to grasp it there's things to where you know I, I could pick and grab but a lot of things you know I'll just start jotting it down to where I could come back to it and then um, not only that but it helps me with refreshers so um, I'll be like, okay, well, I've been relaxed on this. I'm going to go back to notes. Oh, okay. So it's, it's just, it's just a refresher. And I think it's something, obviously as someone that does coaching often and I got people come out and, and you always get, you, you get a ride variety of people, right? You got the guy who's maybe this boss sent him here as a hope and prayer that I'm going to turn this guy around and turn him into something, but he's really this piece of shit. And then you got the guy that's like, oh, I'm new to the industry. So he's trying to learn, but he doesn't really grasp much. Then you guys got, I got some of the guys that are truly wanting to get better. They've been doing it for a little while. They want to, they want to become better. And then I have some guys that are just like, you know, I'm just here for one reason to become a fucking beast. And I feel like, you know, there's certain guys that I've, I've come across and you're one of them and a couple other guys that they just come in, put their head down. They ain't there to party. They ain't there to drink. They ain't there to do anything. You know, I usually always have after parties and stuff like that for my events. Kevin never shows up. One day I just like keep hoping he's going to walk through the door, but he never hangs out. He just goes back to his hotel room and at night he's studying, right? And I think that's the power of like why you've been so successful, right? So like like any coach, right? Like you have some guys that you can you can tell them everything in the world, but they don't implement shit. Kevin's one of those guys that if I told him exactly what to do today, by tomorrow, he's already implementing it into his business. You want to talk a little bit about that and how quick your your revolver is on 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 pulling the trigger on things? I'm very fast. I'm very, very, very fast. Um basically I have to kind of, you know, pull my leash a little bit with unveiling you know more processes stuff like that um the first time i came back i just opened up floodgates and kind of overwhelmed um my small staff but um but yeah uh it isn't anything against anybody else but when i'm out for training or anything i take it as a job and i treat it like a job so uh you, you get what you put into it honestly you know you can be out here wasting your time or you can be out here taking notes going back to your hotel reviewing your notes and you so five years ago you decided to start fist core heating and air right so you know where where'd the idea come from what the where was the motivation because usually there's something that just kicks you right in the ass and you're like okay i'm done i'm doing my own thing well what was your kick in the ass moment the birth of my daughter Maisie. basically um i'm very good with my money at the, you know i 
wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. I had savings and stuff like that, but I want to provide uh, a better living, something that, you know, I had a very loving childhood, but um, we we did what we had to do financially. Um, I won't say how poor everybody's, everybody, you know, came from nothing, but I want to provide the vacations, you know, the clothes. Um, back when I was a kid, we uh, shopped the pay list just like everybody else. And I was that kid getting the four stripe Adidas and cutting off that stripe. So I want to have to, you know, get in a fist fight because somebody make fun of me. So basically it's not like that. Kids aren't, you know, they're not as horrible as what they were, but I just want to provide a future. And, you know, when my kids decide what they want to do, um, support them or actually have the money to put them through college and not have that burden on them to start their adult life. So, I mean, obviously it's, that's a powerful message for any father or anybody, right? Like that's what we do this for, right? Like, you know, I talk to people all the time to come to my training. I said, why the hell would you leave your freaking house, leave your family, leave your life, right? And go to work every day to make less money than humanly possible. Whether you're a technician now, you're a sales guy, you're a business owner, like, is there somebody making more money than you? And that should piss you off. They're doing the same job as you. It should piss you off every day that they make more money than you. So uh, that's obviously a, you know, a powerful statement that you're like, man, I got to, I got to step out and I got to, I got to find another way to make more money. And, and obviously being an entrepreneur is an opportunity, but with opportunity comes what risk, right? And it comes risk. So obviously you're risking it, right? You're leaving your job and you've been there probably for a little while now at this point. Yeah. Eight years, eight years of this job. And you go and say, Hey, I'm going to quit my job. and I'm going to start my own business. And you want to talk a little bit about how you first started getting customers. I know a lot of people are like, how do you get customers when you start out? And I've talked a little bit about how I've done it. What did you do to start getting customers? So basically I had a very supportive boss, um, Chuck. He was the best boss I ever had. Chuck in the truck? Say, What's that? Was that Chuck in the truck? No. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, um, he was very supportive. He told me he was the best technician that he ever met. He was a uh, director of engineering. So basically, long story short, um, for the first year, I was working seven days a week. I was running calls for my company five in the morning before I'd have to go to work and start my job. I was running calls after work. I was running calls Saturdays, Sundays. I was never home and I was just that hungry. And then we had a change of leadership. And long story short, I got this new boss who was a fucking asshole. Um, basically, he uh, he told me to do go fix an oven. And I don't like working on ovens. I can't. But... I, it's nasty. It's greasy. You have to do it overnight. And he basically told me, um, I'll fire you and hire a contractor. So long story short, the next day I had the day off PTO. I had an install going on and I was getting a call from another supervisor, a junior supervisor saying, Donald says he's going to write you up. You know, called no showed. I didn't have the respect to this man. I basically at the time I was, all my calls were on my little, my little pocket notebook. And I looked and I had five installs, you know, that I was having to put off. And uh, I was coming back from Prescott with some equipment. It's about a 45 minute drive. And then I just said, fuck it, I'm done. I'm not gonna work for this guy. I called, tried to call the director of HR. She was there, got the assistant director, told her how I felt about this guy. I'm out. So long story short, um, it was the mo second most scariest thing I ever did, you know, one was proposing to my wife, but this right here, basically how I was told jumping out, it's basically jumping off a cliff, learning how to build an airplane and learn how to fly the fucking thing before you hit the ground. And I, I pulled back on that fucker. It was, I wasn't hitting the ground. It was, I was sick to my stomach. I won't lie. It's, it's a, you know, I just got the chills kind of thinking about it. Right. Cause you think about, I think about, to the day that I quit, right? Like, I'm like, fuck, like, all right, here we go. Like, now what's next, right? And yeah. you're like, what are you, like, you don't know where to go. Like, there's no, there's no freaking roadmap when you first start your business. Like, it's like, hey, figure it out. Hopefully you get some customers. When you get some customers, you better hope you know how to convert them. And then when you know how to convert them, like, I went from, I wasn't on the, I wasn't an installer. So I went from being a sales guy, selling every day, not worrying about fixing units, not worrying about, you know, you know, put installing them to all of a sudden, hey, we got to, we sold it, but how the fuck are we going to get this thing installed? Where are we going to get equipment? How do you mm -hmm. get accounts set up? How do you get, how do you set up an LLC? How do you get your license? How do you do anything? 
And I think it's a, it's a daunting thing already, just all the little things you have to do just to get a business going, right? 100%. Let alone trying to get customers, then trying to install the shit. Then you have to, you know, you're probably running by yourself, servicing and doing everything. How long were you working just you? I'd say first year and a half. I remember doing new cut-ins by myself. That was a motherfucker. You know, yeah. it'd be two, three days of me doing a cut-in by myself. But I had to do what I had to do. And I was providing for my family and I don't want to bring on anybody else because I had that mentality. What you got me out of is, you know, I, I needed to do everything. And once, you know, talking with you and I broke that mentality, I started bringing people on. I think that's one thing. It's hard, right? Like as men and guys, I like to do things a certain way. And, and I've never, and I, and I won't say I've ever been that way because I've always been, you know, I'm, I'd rather bring employees in and bring people in to help me do stuff and get, and I figured, you know, I always figured, it's easier to get stuff done with, with, with help than doing it yourself. But you know, there's, there's some guys out there that are just, that's how they roll. Right. And you're, you're old school, right? You're an old school guy. You're fucking, you're for your true and damn American dude. Like you talk to you, you're like through and through, like this is, this is the dude, right? Like you're old school, how you think. But I feel like over the last couple of years, you've really changed a lot. I feel like, uh, you know, the first time I met you was, uh, I think 2020 during, was it during, no, it's 2021, 2021, uh, was the first time I did a training. Uh, I was right before my dad passed away. And uh, I remember meeting you for the first time and you came out and dude, it was you and Abe, right? Yeah. You had a, you had a helper at that time. And you guys came he out. Was a, he was a full blown tech. Oh, he was a full blown yeah. tech. Yeah. At, at, while we were at the resort, uh, I put him through a full blown four year apprenticeship. That's badass. Yeah. So he's, so he's got one helper at this time. How many calls a day were you guys running at that point? 12 to 15. And this was just two years ago. So, you yeah. know, yeah, I lived just barely over two years ago. So you're running 12 to 15 calls a day. What kind of revenue were you guys doing? This two of you, 270, 270,000 for the year. Yep. So two years ago, you're doing 270,000 a year. It's you and one helper. And, you know, obviously, you know, there's been some things that have happened since then. You've put a lot of work in what, what you want to talk about a little bit of the, of the growth of the business over the last couple of years. It's only honestly been a roller coaster ride once you know, you got me out of that mindset of doing everything. Um, the re well, as we all know, when we first start out, it's because we can't afford somebody, you yeah. know, it's just, you're like, well, if, if I could do this job, I'm making an extra $1,500 a week that I don't have to pay. So long story short, um, just kept on coming to the classes and putting my head down and actually, you know, putting processes and places, positions, and to where I'm at now, we've, we've got 15, 15 employees, 15 employees. And, and you guys are in, in Sedona. What, what kind of a market is there there? How many, how many people live up there in Sedona in the, in the market that you're, you're servicing right now? We call it the Verde Valley. So it's, it's about, it's about six, six towns in about a 30 mile radius. And we service them all. Um, I honestly couldn't tell you how many people it, the Verde Valley has been exploding with, you know, the mass exodus, you know, with all the other states. Everybody but... trying to leave California is what he's trying to say. <laughs> he's like, hey, why? He's like, why are you still here? He's like, he's like, he's like, we're doing the podcast. I'm like, yeah, he's like in California. I'm like, yeah, you have to come back. He's like, son of a bitch. Then he oh, got to, then, here. No, nah, then he got to Huntington Beach and he sent me pictures from his hotel. And he's like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. hundred percent. He's like, why just, you live here. He's like, I just don't want to talk to any of the people. <laughs> So, and, you know, in two years, you went from, you know, you and one employee to now you got 15 employees. How many trucks you got on the road? 12. 12 trucks on the road. And it seems like, in, obviously, in that area, you're one of the bigger companies now. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're one of the larger companies. So, and looks like about 26 months, 27 months, you went from two guys in a truck, two guys in trucks to, you know, having all these trucks on the road. Now you become one of the market leaders. What do you think was like the biggest turning point or what was the biggest thing that got you to where you want to go? Honestly, the coaching from you and Michelle, that, you know, that was leaps and bounds. It, it, everything starts with mindset. And that's where you guys corrected my, you know, old school mentality of I have to do everything. I remember when I had two employees, you know, two field employees, installers, and I was so stressed out about the crane lifts. That I was on, on the crane lifts in between calls on my lunch break, <laughs> setting a unit because I was afraid you know of i'm just a small company and it it just 
you know, your employees don't want something like that happening. So yeah. you just have to learn to trust. Yeah. And it's a hard thing to do, man. Breaking out of that uh, mentality, you have to do everything and, and your employees want you to trust them, right? Like, especially 100%. like, man, if you're hiring these people and especially as a small company, you get to know everybody, right? When you get to a big company, there's like, there's always going to be some knuckleheads, but I feel like at, at your size, you're still like these, you, you should trust these people, right? These people that you brought in, you probably handpicked these guys. I mean, I would imagine in that market, it's not there. It's not, there's probably everybody knows each other, right? Mm-hmm. And you're able to, you know, handpick these guys. So and it's a big deal that you're able to trust them. And I talk to uh, Michelle all the time. Michelle's like, you know, she always says like, you're one of our favorite clients because it's, it's one of those things like as a coach, you tell somebody to do something and they don't freaking do it. And then they keep paying you. It's like, we talked about this the other day. It's frustrating. I'm get, we're getting ready to fire one of our customers or one of our clients who's because dude, I'm like, if you're not going to do any of it, I don't want your money. Like people are like, if you think I really care about the money that much, you're wrong. And the same thing with Michelle, like we don't care that much. Like, yeah, money pays bills, but I don't want to take money just to, just to say that we have a client. Like if you're not going to implement shit. Don't even bother paying us. Don't go to a coach. Don't do anything. If you're not going to listen, you're not going to even engage in any of it. It's, it's nuts. So we, we talk about it all the time as, and I know Michelle has been out there for on site, maybe two on site to this point. Yeah, two two on sites and she went out there and she just, you know, obviously loves you guys, you and your wife. And she thinks you guys are the best. And, but she just remember, she remember flying out to that little town. She's like, man, this thing, this place is pretty, pretty tiny. Like, how, mm-hmm. I don't know how he's freaking starting to blow up like this. So what do you think was a turning point where you're like, now you're starting to become the market leader. And how does that feeling now going around probably the parts houses and seeing the other owners and stuff like that? Are they, are they starting to be like, what the hell is he doing? Or, all these things are, are you kind of get that conversation like, Oh, Kevin's doing something shady or something like that. Cause that's usually what happens when you start blowing up. Basically the biggest thing is just, um, I have a lot of people watching me. It's a small market. We all know each other. And, uh, that's basically, you know, I have a lot of people watch me and it's that whole thing, you know, tell me I can't do something. <laughs> Fucking tell me like that. Me and my, you know, I sent to you and Michelle, yeah. So that's, it's just, it's just all about, you know, proving the naysayers and the haters. And I think one of the other big things you did, right, is, is also, you know, investing in rebranding the business too. So I know you used to have just a regular truck with some stickers and stuff on it. You want to talk about the impact of that, of, of actually, you know, rewrapping your trucks and, and getting that logo bigger and making it pop more. Has that been a big impact on you guys? It's been huge. Um, right here is my old logo i keep it on there the sticker in my case just as a reminder of how far i've came but michelle basically i was really proud of of what i had and you don't know what you don't know like you michelle always preach and honestly i thought it was a shit so i brought her out all excited hey come check out the truck and she's like you have to re- you, you got to rebrand so that was honestly one of the hardest things because it's your baby and i mean i i got a tattooed on me but um it it's all about being seen and you know we were blending in with all the rest of the white bands and uh we rebranded and it's it's you could you could see one of my vans for honestly about a mile away the color just pops well, it's, it's one of those things that's obviously, you know, starting out my business, you know, my brother's in here, we freaking, we had this like really, really bad, like Eagle logo that was like real bad clip art. And then my brother went to a Fiverr and mm-hmm. it made our next logo and everybody's like, dude, when we grew that business, we were already doing $5 million a year. Like, yeah, we were doing $5 million a year before we rebranded and it was only about a year in. So we're like on our high horse. And I still remember the first time Dan Antonelli saw my logo, we were at a service world or something like that in Vegas. I never met Dan before and I walk in and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm Dan Antonelli. I have no idea who the fuck he is. I don't know what he does. He's like, Oh, is that your, is that your uh, logo? I'm like, yeah, it's my logo. I'm all happy about it. He's like, yeah, it's kind of shitty. And I'm like, this, what the fuck is this dude? He's like 130 pounds soaking wet. I'm like, you won't go get something. I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, you, you have that attachment to it, right? Like, yeah. and then you take a step back and you're like, okay. Cause I remember I was like, a lot of my staff was like, don't change it. Like, it's fine. We're doing good. And then I'm like, I started, you know, I started really looking at it and I made the decision. Like I was, I made the decision that my staff, like we don't need to do this. I'm like, yeah, we do. And that made a big impact on my business. So like, if you guys are really thinking about rebranding your business or whatever it is and, and, uh, and for listening to this, Tommy and, and, uh, and, and, uh, Dan, congratulations on the sale. Congratulations, Tommy on, yes. on buying, uh, on buying kick charge and Dan on taking some chips off the table. So that's exciting. I'm excited to see where that goes. 
Uh, but yeah, man, just trying to re a rebrand is going to be a big deal, especially in a small market. Like I figure, I, I think almost in a small market more than a big market, I, I feel like, because like, you, you only see so many trucks driving around and yours are probably just popping up all over the place. So I'd imagine is your competition starting to do some rebranding or how's that going? So what was kind of funny about that is um, nobody really knew how big I was and what how I've been able to scale the way I'm scaling is I reinvest into the company a hundred percent. I'm not, you know, you do what you want to do with your business, but, um, I was buying all these flashy things. I was just head down wanting to grow this, uh, into something big. And, um, basically the gloves came off when, uh, I, I had a really big commercial job, made a bunch of money on it. So I had the money to go ahead and drop that type of money on rebranding the whole entire fleet. But um, once that happened, everybody thought, oh, I had a couple vans running around, but you know, boom, 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 boom. They're loud, you know, I call it the Catalina fucking wine mixer <laughs> compared to everybody else's, but um, nothing against anybody else, you know, your brand's your brand and that's your baby and that's the hardest thing to do, but rebrand, rebrand it was, it was well worth the investment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's 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 one of those things. It's like it does take a lot of money to grow a business. And people ask me, "How'd you grow Absolute so fast?" And all these, you know, all this other stuff you do. I'm like, dude, I don't. I'm not over here buying fucking all kinds of crazy shit. I'm not buying yachts and boats and all this stuff. I'm reinvesting. Like, mm -hmm. you don't go from zero to to where you're at now without spending money, right? And you don't go from zero to where I, where Absolute is at without reinvesting a lot, right? And it, it's stressful. It's 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 almost like it's consuming right like you want to just cash out like most owners they want to sit back they want to go on their vacation they want to get their their boats and i think tommy Mello talks about it a lot right like dude he drove a freaking you know old freaking toyota tundra forever mm -hmm. because he didn't want a new truck he'd rather reinvest that money into his business and so many people are are scared of a, a delayed gratification that they would rather not you know and i think delayed gratification is is usually a, a big sign uh, someone that's able to have to take or to do delay gratification is a big sign of if someone that's going to be successful. So I think that kind of sounds like what you did is like, Hey, I'm willing to sit back for a little bit. I know that if I, you know, plant some seeds for the next couple of years, that it's going to fruit into something great. And that kind of sounds like what you've done. Definitely. So what's next, man? What is, what is the future of fiscal or heating and air? Where do you see yourself? What, what's the plan with the business? Like if you're a perfect scenario, the next five years, what happens? Basically, um, I'd like to add a, probably, you know, obviously about five, six more vans. And then just because of the market share where I live, I really don't want to have to travel and go out of my way. So basically I'm just going to scale to where the market can support it and then just keep trucking, just, you know, refine processes and just, you know, low drag. Yeah. No, that's, that's exciting, man. I think, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's different ways to look at business. Kevin's looking at it as a, this is a long-term business for him and he wants to have it for a long time. And, and like I said, hopefully one day you build something and you want to retire, you can go, I think you're uh, talking about living on a, being a, a boat charter out in Florida. Is that what we're talking about? Where, where we're uh, retirement. Uh, yeah. Being a commercial uh, fishing captain, taking people out and deep sea fishing. Well, I think, uh, I don't think you're far off from that, man. I think that if you put your head down and you have that opportunity to do that, do what you want. And that's what you guys have as an opportunity in this industry, right? You can either work forever or you can, you know, you can decide over the next couple of years to put your head down get some processes dialed in and do the things that are necessary to grow a business. That's going to not only be very profitable for you now, uh, but something you're gonna be able to sell one day and, and hopefully be able to live the life that you want. So Kevin, man, I'm, I'm excited that we had you on. I really want to bring on and kind of tell your story because it's it's similar to a lot of guys, right? There's a guy that's listening to this right now. You probably got you probably you and one buddy or you just you yourself. You have to decide that you want to change, right? It's not going to just happen overnight. You're not going to just show, no one's going to show up and show you how to run your business. You have to make that decision. You have to reinvest. You have to invest in yourself. You got to invest in your business and you got to grow. And I think, the, you know, if you're looking for someone to help you with that, that's what we do here at, at Profit Rocket. Go to callprofitrocket.com. We'd love to jump on a, on, a, on a call with you and see if there's something that we fit to help you grow. Uh, Kevin, when's the last thing you want to tell anybody? Just, uh, just hold on. It's, it's, it's stressful. It's a roller coaster ride. There's a lot of ups and downs. So I would just have, have to say, is get your mind right. One, one other thing we didn't really touch on before we wrap this up is, is Kevin's fitness. Forgot about this. Well, how important, how much of an impact has that been? I mean, since the last nine months, how many pounds have you lost? 
I weighed in a couple weeks ago, 191, but um, I've lost about 52 pounds. So 52 pounds in nine months. Uh, what do you think was the, you know, kind of the, the factor that led you to where you're at, man? And how, how impactful has that been on you and your business and your life? Um, it's been huge, uh, just for my mental. Um, September was a dark month. Um, September was hard for everybody in Arizona. Uh, we had monsoons all year. Anyways, I was bleeding money. And um, like you guys say, nobody's going to come come and save you. You're not going to have a fucking pity party. Um I pulled my head out of my ass. I was dropping into a depression. I caught it before, you know, I went full blown into depression. A lot of people won't talk about this, you know, being an owner. Um, it's, it's one of the most hardest things to do, but, uh, yeah, I just got my mind right and diet is 97% of it. And motivation only goes so far. It's fucking discipline and I'm very disciplined. And, uh, so it's, it's a new lifestyle. I'm down two waist sizes. I'm down three shirt sizes. You look like a whole different person too. I mean, you can see it in your face. I mean, you were really red. You were probably going through some, you know, kinds of blood hypertension, pre-diabetes. Now I'm 120 over 80. I mean, my phys, I just had a physical blood work, the whole nine yards, everything, cholesterol levels, everything. And you um, just, you just finished your first 10 K, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just finished my first 10 K in Flagstaff a couple weeks ago. Did you think you were, did you ever think at your age, you were going to be running 10 Ks? If you would have told, if I would have told you that two years ago when I met you? Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's badass, man. And, and the, the importance of getting your health right. And, and we all know it, right? We all put it off and we put it off until one day it smacks us in the face. And that's kind of what, you know, sounds like Kevin was getting smacked in the face. And he said, I'd rather fight back than keep getting smacked in the face. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, that might take what, what it takes for everybody. But, you know, if you guys are out there listening, get your health right, get your mind right. And focus on your business. You have a good, op great opportunity, like a level ten earning opportunity in front of you to go win. You know, win in this, win in this industry very easily. If you want to put your head down and learn. So Kevin's one of those guys. He's he's a testament to if you do the hard work, you can make shit happen. I'm excited to see what happens over the next couple of years, Kevin. I'm excited to call you a friend, and obviously, you know, I'm excited to you know be a mentor to you. But like I said, friends come first to me. So Kevin, man, it's a pleasure having you on. Thanks, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you guys for tuning into the Profit Rocket podcast, episode number 22. Uh, next week, we're going to have another exciting guest on. So make sure to like and su subscribe either on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Uh, also, don't forget to go to events.callprofitrocket.com. Get signed up for our Austin event. It's going to be September 27th through 29th. Uh, it's Austin, Texas. We've got an amazing lineup. It's going to be a great event. Go on there, get signed up, get, uh, get your rooms locked in before it's too late. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will hear from you guys next week. No sleep, no rest. Might crash, might wreck. But first, die. Stretch. I don't run it off. I wake up. Flex. Thumb down, not check. No drip, this. I don't run it off.